I'm here at the Cambridge University Library, which contains every single book ever published in the UK and Ireland since the 1700s. So it's very likely that what I want is here. So a few days ago, I requested paper. Not too surprisingly, they have it. And so let's go. Here it is, the essay on the application of mathematical analysis to the theories of electricity and magnetism by George Green, published in 1828. The content of this whole book is online, but being here, holding a physical copy just feels different. This is arguably one of the most important publications in mathematical science, but behind it is a story of injustice. The story does not start here though but a bit further north. <music> to preface this video, I am going to, for the first time, draw for the channel. I'm not particularly good at it, but hopefully the story itself is interesting. Also, stick around for some funny footage in the end. George Green was born in Nottingham in 1793. His father, also called George Green, ran a bakery. Very fortunately, the bakery business went well, and his father made enough money to be able to put his son into a private academy. In there, he displayed great interests in maths and sciences, but he was there only for about a year, and that year was the only formal education he had, and then he had to work in a bakery with his dad. He didn't like the family business, but he had no choice. At the time, the situation in Nottingham was not good because of poverty and frequent riots by starving workers. So the family moved a mile east to Snanton, where the father bought some land and built this windmill. The father hired a mill manager, William Smith, whose daughter Jane formed a relationship with George Green. They were never married, but they had seven children together, one of them also called George Green. Come on, there are so many other names out there, you don't have to name your son George all the time. Anyway, the middle green didn't really like his duties in a mill. Just like the bakery business, he found it tedious. Instead, he was really interested in mathematics. So at the age of 30, he became a member of Nottingham Subscription Library, which is still here but renamed Bromley House Library. Green taught himself more mathematics by reading more books in the library, and about five years later, he published this 1828 essay, which I read a copy of in the beginning. Because the title said something about electricity and magnetism, it attracted quite some Nottingham people to buy it, but the content was so advanced that nobody who bought it could understand, with the exception of Edward Bromhead who studied mathematics in Cambridge before, and was also a very rich and influential figure. Bromhead was incredibly impressed by Green's work and wrote him a letter, offering support for any future papers to be published. However, because Green was told that this letter was only written out of politeness, and given a huge disparity between their social statuses, Green didn't reply back until around two years later. But after Green's letter explaining why he didn't reply sooner, Bromhead promptly replied, and they began exchanging letters. During their exchange of letters, Charles Babbage and William Huell, another two influential Cambridge mathematicians, came into the story by offering guidance on the topics and writing style for Green's papers. Electricity and magnetism were not very popular at the time, so these topics were advised against. And for style, they advised that he should write more concisely, which makes sense when you read his first letters to Bromhead. How come this whole paragraph is a sentence without any punctuation? Before all these conversations started, however, Green's father died in 1829. 
quite fortunately leaving enough for Green's living. And Green was quite relieved about this because he could abandon the milling business, which he didn't like anyway, and pursued further in mathematics. Eventually, in a letter to Bromhead, Green indicated his inclination for Cambridge, and Bromhead, who still had a lot of influence in Gondol and Keys College, wrote a recommendation letter for Green. And just like that, he went in. But there is one little caveat. To obtain a bachelor's degree, you need to be, well, a bachelor. But Green had children with Jane Smith already. However, they were technically never married, so he could get into Cambridge. He was already 40 years old when he matriculated, way older than anybody around him. He was undoubtedly a great mathematician, but alas, when he finally set the exam in the Senate House, he was only the fourth wrangler. All of his friends were quite disappointed, but Green was not very good at Latin and Greek, and there was a more important reason. To quote DM Cannell in her definitive biography of George Green, from 1801 onwards, however, the examination papers were printed. The top place in the examination was virtually won by the candidate who could get most down on paper. The system was not adapted either to cultivate originality or to advance mathematical science. On the contrary, it favoured the candidate with a retentive memory who had the good fortune and the finance to have been tutored by one of the leading coaches in the university. And Green was not wealthy enough to be privately tutored. The person who came first, commonly known as the senior wrangler, and the third wrangler, don't even have a Wikipedia page. Nobody knows who they are, so who's laughing now? Only the second wrangler, Sylvester, actually achieved some fame as a mathematician. The moral of this is, I guess, exams don't define you. After he graduated, he stayed in Keys to become a fellow of the college and wrote some influential papers in maths and science. At the time, these were considered important rather than the 1828 essay. Nowadays, it's the opposite. After a few years, he was ill and returned to Nottingham, perhaps to his wife's delight because he finally paid more attention to the family than his academic achievements. They lived opposite St. Stephen's Church for the rest of Green's life. The place they were staying was demolished quite some years ago to make way for the Salvation Army because, coincidentally, William Booth, the founder of the Salvation Army, was born around here as well. George Green died at the age of 47, which is quite early. His grave can be found here at St. Stephen's Churchyard. It might not be clear on camera, but basically, it's said that George Green's mom and dad, Green himself, and one of his sons were buried down here. However, his death was pretty much ignored. There was only a brief obituary in some local newspapers. The story didn't end here. The 1828 essay was only published locally and outside of Nottingham, not a lot of mathematicians knew this. The only reason why Green was not into total obscurity is William Thomson, later known as Lord Kelvin. Thomson was interested in electricity and magnetism and saw Green's essay listed as one of the footnotes of someone's work. And so Thomson decided to look into this. Finally, he found some copies of the original essay. Thomson was immediately impressed with Green's work and spoke very highly of him when he traveled to Paris, where he immediately showed Green's essay to Sturm and Leuville upon arrival, who were also impressed and Thomson worked hard to publish Green's essay in continental Europe and also back in the UK. And from there, Green's work finally got some recognition. Bromhead and his mathematicians, friends, and later Lord Kelvin were not the only ones speaking highly of Green's work. When Einstein visited Nottingham in 1930, he said that Green was 20 years ahead of his time. Julian Schwinger, who won the Nobel Prize of Physics jointly with Richard Feynman, even gave a talk called The Greening of Quantum Field Theory, George and I, because Green's functions were immensely useful in quantum electrodynamics. The opening paragraph is quite interesting. 
the young theoretical physicist of a generation or two earlier subscribed to the belief that if you haven't done something important by age 30, you never will. Obviously, they were unfamiliar with the history of George Green, the Miller of Nottingham, because Green wrote the important essay at age 35. In 1993, a bicentenary celebration of George Green's birthday was held nationally, and George Green was given a memorial plaque in Westminster Abbey, next to Isaac Newton's grave, and beside a lot of other prolific scientists like Kelvin, Maxwell, and Faraday. Nowadays, Green's Mill has been restored and turned into a science centre, a tourist attraction for students learning about electricity and science in general. At the time I was there, the wind wasn't strong enough so it wasn't operating, but it is running the other days. There is also a park nearby which has some math-related facilities. But why am I making this video? Well, Green's story was remarkable and inspiring. He only had one year of formal education and was almost entirely self-taught. The amazing thing is that he worked pretty much full time in the mill and yet produced some of the most important papers in the 19th century and beyond. Another perhaps more important reason is that Green's English contemporaries are disproportionately more well known, which is an injustice. Faraday for his law of induction, Maxwell for his equations, Kelvin for the temperature scale, Bull for Boolean algebra, but most people don't know the existence of Green until they go to a college or university where Green's theorem, identities, and functions would be covered. Coupled with the fact that Green didn't enjoy the public recognition he deserved in his lifetime, I just want to pay a tribute to this mathematician to undo the injustice that he was not recognized properly. Some might say that is because Green's theorems and functions are advanced and probably not accessible to the general public, so I'm going to change that and talk about Green's functions in the next video. Thanks so much for DM Canal for her amazing efforts in the biography of George Green, Bromley House Library for letting me in even though I'm not a member, Green's Mill for their guidance, the patrons for paying for my trips in the video, and last but not least, you for watching. Consider subscribing if you're new here, don't forget to like the video as well. See you next time! I have also been to the George Green Library in the University of Nottingham. Brady, I'm coming for you. I really want to go down that slide.